uh, is there a clicker or something, or you guys advance for me? Yeah. Great. Uh, is there a visible clock? Wait, that's great. Yeah. Fabulous. So, um, let me very briefly start at the beginning. Uh, so, this point on that. Yeah. So, this building here is a thing called a hex here. Uh, it's a plywood shed. It's incredibly materials efficient. I invented it in 2002 when somebody asked me whether I could figure out how to make refugee camp buildings that could be relocated so when the refugees were ready to go home, you could flat pack the shelters, throw them on the truck, transport them with the refugees, and then they'd have places to go when they went back. Uh, that came out of a design workshop called the Sustainable Settlements Charette, very much like this one. Um, we built one model in Haiti and nobody would come and see it. We, we wrote to everybody involved in sheltering, 160 people in 102 different organizations. Not a single person would come into a taxi to come to a, a safe place in Fort Prince and take a look at a transitional sheltering idea. Burning Man, on the other hand, picked the things up like a house on fire. Burning Man is a 60,000 person arts festival in America, and they build about 2,500, 3,000 shelters a year there. We know that because we have excellent drone and satellite imagery from Burning Man, so you can do aerial survey very easily. And they just literally download the plans from the internet for free, build the things themselves out of materials in the supply chain, and any humanitarian agency in the world could take those designs and scale. Right? They're very easy to build, they're very cheap, 10% of the price per unit per year that you would expect for a tent. Uh, Quite a few agencies have built one or two units, just to kind of really test units, stuff in Sri Lanka, apparently stuff in Africa. Uh, we have some very delightful video that we found on Facebook of somebody who built one of the things. We haven't been able to, even been able to identify what language they're speaking. It's just a bunch of video on the word hex here. We have no idea where it is. Uh, here is Johan Carlson, who's the designer of the IKEA shelter, which has recently been in the papers. Uh, I spent several years going out to workshops in Sweden with Johan, and we built a number of these things together. So what I'm going to talk about is the difficulty of this kind of hard innovation, and why I think the time has come for innovations that could potentially work much faster in the environment that we're in. Because this stuff, frankly, just doesn't work. The actual hard humanitarian stuff hasn't really changed since the end of World War II. The tents are identified with the same models that were being used then. The practices have not really changed either. We still basically approach the hard end of the humanitarian spectrum by building a World War II era military camp with materials which are being specifically commissioned out of the industrial supply chain to meet the World War II era specifications. It's a template that was set with the European refugees when they had tons of military surplus and lots and lots and lots of former soldiers to arrange it all, but that's where your refugee camp template comes from. And it hasn't changed in 70 years, and in all probability it's just not going to. Um, let's talk about human-centered design. I also work in a human-centered design paradigm. I put the human being here, around the side, the hard risks. Too hot, too cold, hunger, thirst, illness, injury. What will kill the person that you are trying to help? What levels of organization? I don't know if you can read this. Individual, household, village, town, region, nation, world. What level of response is responsible for protecting people from that specific cause? A hard accountability model based on epidemiology. So this is the kind of approach that I took to reforming the, re uh, the management of refugees with the impression that it would be possible to get humanitarian agencies to change their ways and come along for the ride. And it's not. I worked with the Netherlands Red Cross for years, I worked with UNHCR, I worked with the American Department of Defense, I worked with DFID, you name it, I've been there with this story and these technologies, and there is zero adoption. And that's not because this stuff is expensive, I'm giving it away, right? The problem is there is fundamentally no readiness or willingness to adapt at the hard physical level. This does not mean no fix is possible, but it just means if you're talking about fixing this level of the situation, don't hold your breath. What does work? Common operational picture. So this is a company that I worked with called ACRO. They're a charity run out of the Netherlands, and what they have is software for managing uh, spending on water and sanitation. So the software is free, it's open source, anybody can download it, adapt it, customize it, use it. Uh, they've got about 3 billion of assets under management, and this is a map of water and sanitation rollouts. The 
want to say in Malaysia that it might be Indonesia. Um, this has been wildly successful because it's taking problems that everybody agrees ought to be solved, it's taking methods that everybody has agreed are the methods for solving those problems, digging holes in the ground, building water points, all this kind of stuff, and it's simply allowing better cooperation between all the actors who are working on those problems. So on the back end of this, there's something that looks like an e-commerce site, and you could basically search for the kind of project you want to fund, you find something you want to fund, you put in 25,000 euros, it, it's still going to need another 60, but somebody else can go in and then add the next 25, and pretty soon you've got the thing funded. And this thing, thing really, really works. They're channeling enormous amounts of spending over that, with very little institutional resistance. So it doesn't change the hard practices that are being done on the ground, it does change the interaction between the actors who are working towards these goals, and it is extremely effective with very little institutional resistance. So this, I think, is a tractable problem. Uh, a second thing, bureaucratic maps versus physical maps. So that is a physical map. That's a structural or an infrastructural map. That's a bureaucratic map. So one of the problems that we have in this field is that there are actually three spaces we operate in simultaneously. There is a physical space, there is a bureaucratic space, and there's an infrastructural space. And political uh, economy and economic geography of infrastructural space are still very, very poorly understood. Uh, Benjamin Bratton's seeing like a state begins to dig into that. There's another book called The Stack. But even inside of academia, the understanding that critical infrastructure is its own kind of geography is still very, very new. And almost everything that humanitarian agencies do involves creating and maintaining critical infrastructure. So part of the reason it's hard is we just don't have a really good academic science of mapping and maintaining critical infrastructure systems. It's basically terra incognita. Right, so this is probably the most important thing I'm going to say today. Don't do Facebook's job. Uh, there are only really 10 or 15 genuinely first class institutions to manage information technology in the world. Right? Department of Defense, Facebook, Google, Amazon, and a handful of others. You know, you could point to Microsoft, Apple, and that's it. This is because hard IT is the hardest thing that human beings do. It's more consuming of intellectual firepower than fundamental physics, than medicine. It's the hardest thing there is. And the people at the frontier of that field are often very, very, very weird, and nobody cares because the problems are just insoluble, and if they can make even an inch of progress, they're in charge, end of story. Uh, I've spent probably most of the last 15 years working for autistic people, just building the bridge between what they understand about the structure of mathematics and what's going into the actual real world. And, you know, I'm not a dumb guy, and I'm just a translation unit most of the time. So the idea that the humanitarian world is going to build its own IT platforms and that this stuff will in some way fundamentally change what happens at the scale of billions of people is completely unrealistic. It's not going to happen. Don't waste your time trying. On the other hand, right, these guys can't get access to a global network unless somebody provides them with power, unless somebody provides them with Wi-Fi or free phone cards. So being able to build the bridge between where people are right now and this enormous integrated global network, and I don't mean by that just software, right? as my colleague Paul Curry at the back says, you know, what people need is network access, but that's the economic networks, it's the social networks, it's the uh, you know, it's the entire bureaucratic network. What people need is this first mile access to get them hooked onto those networks. And that is a problem which is firmly in humanitarian space. That's exactly the kind of thing which is currently solved. You do water, you do sanitation, you do light. There's no reason you can add internet to it. I did a project six or seven years ago with DFID where we put 100,000 lights into camps in Pakistan. And it was very successful. They were just little solar hockey packs. Today, if you were doing that same thing again, you would get something that also did Wi-Fi, mesh networks, something like that. So the idea that the first step is just getting people into contact with the modern world, I think is a tractable, pro tractable problem. It wouldn't be that hard to suggest that telecommunications are a fundamental resource that needs to be provided in the same way that water is, and a hum change in humanitarian approaches, which just said, OK, Telecoms is behind water and sanitation and food, but it's the next thing on the list before, I don't know, whatever the next thing would be, right? That might be one simple concrete thing that could be generally agreed on upon and pushed for. 
just making telecoms critical, adding it to the list of necessities and then working from there is a manageable thing. Getting companies to donate enormous numbers of phones or getting somebody to commission a cheap phone, all that stuff is manageable. So that might be a thing that we could think about doing that is simple enough to be tractable and probably affects every organization in the room. That's a pretty achievable goal. Uh, Self-organizing systems. So Starfish and the Spider is kind of where the state of the art was 10 years ago. Uh, very popular in the US, largely because of the implications for anti-terrorism. Uh, personally, I think the state of the art has moved on from there. Peers Inc., uh, which I was involved in, actually edited chunks of it, um, is probably a much more interesting book from the perspective of humanitarian organizations. Because what it focuses on specifically is what do you do at the center? What are the functions of the hub? And what are the functions at the periphery? And how do the hub and the periphery interact? So the hub function is basically your heavy logistics and it's your bulk uh, material purchasing. It's the hard technical expertise inside organizations like WHO. The network response is all at the periphery. And the periphery is people using Facebook to organize you know, busloads of goods that go out to refugee camps or wherever it happens to be. It's people self-rescuing by contacting their relatives and asking them to send them a plane ticket and some cash to get a bus. Right? So the notion that what we're really talking about is contained in this peer tech model, of course in Robin's book, the peer is assumed to be an individual with a smartphone and the ink is assumed to be a large company on the American template that you'd see from, for example, Airbnb. But there is no reason that those functions you know, couldn't be re-examined from the perspective of, okay, the ink will be humanitarian actors and the peers will be first responders, local groups, right the way down to rescue, uh, self-rescuing and mutual aid refugees. And mutual aid is extremely important. As they say in an American context, the citizen is the first responder. And once you have cell phones and the ability to put software onto cell phones, the idea that you can do a lot of management simply by putting the correct information onto the phone at the correct time, if you have seen the sea move out, you should run uphill now. That kind of stuff is very, very possible. Okay, so what did I do about this? <clears throat> the answer is I left humanitarian space after basically 15 years of banging my head on this problem. Right? And I left humanitarian space because it doesn't innovate. Nothing's happened. Right? So Two years ago, I decided I was going to quit, I was going to go into the real world, and I was going to come back once I was looking a little more like Elon Musk, and I was going to pay for the solution to these problems myself. First thing I did was I took part in a project called Ethereum. I was the project manager for the Ethereum launch. Most of the large banks, most of the large humanitarian research agencies have blockchain projects. Most of those projects are on Ethereum. So I project managed that. I built parts of it. Right? This is the beginnings of laying out fundamental rock-hard infrastructure on which you could then hang later humanitarian operations. This gives us what they call in the US unity of effort without unity of command. It will take 10 years for those technologies to mature to the point where you would trust anybody's life to one, but if we don't start building those things now, we're not going to have them when we need them, so I went off to do that. And now I am basically running a venture capital firm with the objective of making enough money to be able to privately finance the humanitarian R&D that I've been trying to get done through institutions for 15 years. So I'm laying this down as a direct challenge. Do something. Otherwise, the future will be run by individual actors like me who don't have any fundamental control by civil society, don't have any fundamental control by nation states, and just solve the problems any way they see fit. If you want to save the legitimacy of the uh, humanitarian world, you have to start innovating fast enough to solve these problems or the future is simply going to be run by self-starting tech entrepreneurs that can outspend the UN in their chosen areas, and then very rapidly the humanitarian vision will go under one last time and not be seen again. You must innovate. Thank you.